Hi there, uh, and welcome to my talk about bringing AI ethics from principles to practice. Uh, my name is Michael, uh, and I'm very glad and feel honored that I've uh, been invited to speak here at ConfraConf. Um, yeah, and I'll be talking a bit about how we bring very abstract principles or discussions about transparency um, or accountability of AI systems into practice and how technologists like yourself can actually work on it. Um, and I will present a project that I've worked on, a research project um, the past about two years, uh, where we've dealt with these issues. Um, and where maybe we found at least a partial answer to the question that the comic here on the left poses, whether we can actually certify something as ethical or not, um, and uh, or whether that is more of an illusion, like it might be with a human being. So, first of all, you might ask yourself, who am I? And you will uh, get to know from the work that I do that I am not a technologist. I'm a social scientist, uh, and I've studied uh, human rights and digitization um, and worked on uh, topics, for example, like um, surveillance, global surveillance, and how it affects human rights. But in the past four years, I focused on ethics of algorithms and the design process around algorithmic systems and also specifically systems with machine learning components. Um, and since the beginning of the year, I now work as a freelance policy analyst and moderator based in Oslo. Um, so I come from the social science perspective, studied political science, sociology, but I combine it with a technological perspective. And this interdisciplinary work is at the core of what I do. Um, and that's why I'm also very eager to learn always about other disciplines and what other people's perspectives are on the topic. So I'm especially interested to hear from you. Um, most of you are uh, probably technologists, software developers, data scientists, and the like. And to hear from you what you think about the topic and about the, uh, the proposals that we've worked on in a group that consists of both of technologists and of social scientists. So that's why maybe I can bring a bit of a different perspective in here, um, but I hope uh, still something that might be of value or interesting to you. And what do I want to talk about today? I want to uh, talk about first why do we even think about regulating artificial intelligence systems? And then about what a standard actually means and what a frame for a standard is. Then I will uh, present the specific project that I've worked on, which has this very cryptic name VDE spec 90012, which is a specification, so a industry standard. And I will then also talk a bit about how that standard can be now applied in practice before concluding by putting it into the context of the ecosystem of AI regulation that is currently developing, especially within Europe, and uh, opportunities and challenges of, um, of the approach that we've developed, especially what the limitations are. Uh, if you have questions about this, um, in the meantime, anytime, just post them in the Slack channel. Um, you can find the link to the Slack channel uh, below the stream in the um, in the link. And then, uh, or you can, of course, also comment here on uh, the stream on YouTube. And I will be happy to answer. So let's first talk about why even regulating artificial intelligence systems or the design and use of those systems. And the number one reason is that we are using artificial intelligence systems, systems with machine learning components in more and more areas where it directly affects our lives and our rights or human rights or our basic rights as individuals or citizens. One example would be um, in the hiring process. So as you might know, uh, especially larger companies are using machine learning systems to filter job applications in order to fasten um, in order to make the hiring process a bit faster. So in order to help uh, human resources departments filter out what are the most likely applicants to be successful for a certain position. And if, for example, 100 persons, 100 people apply to a certain position, then only the top 5% or only the top 10% are filtered out 
uh, through this machine learning system. And then human resources only has to look at those top 10 applications. So here, a machine learning system is being used in an area which determines whether you get a job or not, whether you are able to make a living or not, whether you are able to get a job that fits your criteria, that it fits your competencies or not. So it affects directly how your life develops. And if the system is used in a way that, for example, excludes systematically women or that excludes systematically people of color, then we would have a discriminatory effect in an area that's very, very central to our lives, uh, our workplace and our work. And there are many other examples where machine learning systems are used in decision processes which have an effect on us, on our lives and on our rights. The second thing why we talk about uh, regulating those systems is because this regulation matters and because it is important and can make a difference. Uh, posting specific requirements for machine learning systems and their design can help to make them better. Uh, for example, one of these requirements can be the transparency of systems so that we understand how they work, what criteria go into it, and why the system uh, gives a certain output and not a different output. And let's look at the example of the system that was used in France. Uh, they had a system called Parcoursup, which was used at uh, universities or for the university system to filter uh, out university applications. So students who have finished high school would send their application for university spots for different courses into a central system. And that central system would then uh, using actually not uh, machine learning, but simple uh, simple statistics, um, would then analyze the applications and then give them the spot at uh, universities which is most suitable for them. However, which criteria exactly were hard-coded into this filter, um, it, that wasn't transparent to the public. That was only known within the Ministry of Education in France. Uh, and student bodies were protesting against it because they wanted to know why are we getting a certain university spot and not a spot at a different university? Why did I was I not allowed to go to, for example, the Sorbonne, but was sent to a different university? And so students uh, went to court. They debated a lot. And ultimately, the ministry... <laughs> of education in France sent them 200 pages printed out that included the source code of uh, this filter mechanism. Uh, and then they reverse engineered it and found out that, for example, the place of living, the place of residence was a relevant factor for how people were assigned to certain universities. And the problem with that is, however, that especially the more uh, more publicly known universities, the so-called elite universities like the Sorbonne, they are in areas where also residence is relatively expensive, right? Where rent is expensive, where ha house prices are high. So therefore, people who lived in these rich residential areas were also more likely to be admitted to those elite universities. So the system had a bias against people with lower income or with people who lived in lower income areas. And this was only known and could only be debated because there was transparency after students fought for it. And after they fought for it and publicly uh, debated and criticized that the place of residence was a relevant factor, the system was scrapped and a different system was uh, put in its place that doesn't have the place of residence in it anymore. So transparency matters and can help improve the way we use algorithmic systems. And the third area why we need regulation is, or why we need to talk a lot about regulation is because systems and application contexts vary. So let's assume we use a machine learning system to optimize storage and distribution of goods in a certain central storage area. Um, and the issue is that we can't have just one kind of regulation, one set of requirements, just for all optimization algorithms. 
because we can use those those um, models for different kinds of application contexts, right? I could use it to optimize at posten.no. I could use it to optimize it their logistical centers, right, of, of the national mail provider. And that might be not as relevant or as critical. But now let's look at hospitals and let's assume that we would use the same system to optimize storage and distribution of medical goods within hospitals or between hospitals. If there's a mistake in that system, if something goes wrong, if it's biased, that could have immediate effects on human lives. While if there is a mistake with, with uh, mail or with packages, a package might be delayed, for example. So we have different application contexts, and therefore we need to have context-specific regulation that always looks at what are the potential effects, what are the potential risks of the use of uh, artificial intelligence systems in a certain area. So from these three uh, starting points of why even think about regulating AI, we can form a bit of a frame for a potential standard, right? Number one, the standard would need to be value-based and include ethical and human rights considerations. It's not just about practical considerations that the system, for example, works, that it is reliant, but since these systems are being used in areas where they have an effect on us, where they have an effect on society, we need to think what are the values which guide the development and the design and the use of those systems. Secondly, we need to think about how we can put implementation into practice. We need to operationalize these values, saying that a system needs to be transparent or that a system needs to be fair. That's not enough because we don't specifically know uh, what this means in practice. How do I ensure that something is transparent? How do I ensure that something is fair? Right. So we need to go into detail and implement values through operationalization. And the third point is that we need to figure out how do we take into account the context? How do we take into account the area where the system is being applied? And how do we take into account different risks um, for different application contexts? A standard can help to define uh, these kinds of regulation and can help to implement principles in practice. And a standard can then also be linked to other uh, forms of regulation, for example, certification mechanisms or a label. Um, and that's also what we've worked on and what, what I will present shortly. But why even have a standard? What does a standard provide? Uh, what is its benefits? Well, first of all, a standard can provide transparency and information to consumers. So if you, while developing a machine learning system, follow a certain standard and you communicate that, then the consumer, whether it may be an individual consumer who uses an app or a company that buys the app from you or the government that buys the application that you've developed, they know what, what kind of guidelines you followed. They understand that there are certain things that you have considered with regard to transparency, with regard to fairness and other values. Um, and they know that easily. You don't need to explain it in detail to them because you can always use the standard as a communication tool. And that also allows consumers to choose um, in a more sovereign way what kind of systems they want to use or what kind of systems they want to buy. For example, only those systems that follow certain standards. Secondly, it provides a frame of reference, may it be for government or for companies. Companies can say, well, we want to follow these standards, so please implement them in practice. Or they might say, we only follow parts of certain standards, um, those parts that are relevant or interesting to us. So it provides a basis for discussion within companies, within teams, or within the government when it comes to regulation on what the implementation of certain values mean, means. And thirdly, and that's probably most relevant for many of you, is that standards provide orientation for how to implement certain things in practice. They provide specific guidelines on what to do, 
on how to design systems and on how to uh, develop and implement them. And that was also the basis for the BDE spec that we have worked on. So the standard that I'm about to present, which has the uh, very cryptic name of VCIO-based description of systems for AI trustworthiness characterization. Uh, we have just published this a bit over a month ago. And if you want to download it, the link was a bit long, but I've created a short link that you can see here. And of course, you can also download the slides later on if you want. Um, to look at the whole uh, standard, I will only present parts of it because uh, we can't go into uh, into every detail, but I hope to give you an overview of what we've developed here. And we have taken into account exactly those three um, three main points that we've taken from the beginning, right? We need a value-based evaluation. That's what we've developed. We have considered context dependency within the standard. It allows for context-dependent context evaluation. And the standard, uh, at least in the form that it is right now, is very open to how it will be used. Right? You could use it in your company or in your team for self-assessment by just following it and declaring yourself that you have followed it. But we are also thinking about developing it into an independent label or a certification where a third party would assess and check whether all the guidelines set out in the standards have been followed. And who developed this? Where does this come from? So I've been part of a group that has been led by the VDE, that is the German Association of Electrotechnicians, Electricians and Informaticists. So it's a um, yeah, it's a large industrial um, industrial union, um, and they have led a group uh, that consisted both of people from science, uh, from scientific research institutes, or from think tanks. I myself participated as part of the think tank iRights Lab, but we also had industry professionals, people from large, mainly German companies, um, or at least headquartered in Germany, who have um, given to us the input of how this would be implemented in practice and how we can ensure that it is actually implemented in practice. Um, the team has been has consisted mainly of people from Germany. That was just the start. But the standard that we've published can be used by anyone anywhere. And the next project phase, where we are looking into developing this into an AI trust label, that's going to be on a European level. Uh, and open to anyone who wants to cooperate. So if you are interested in, you know, in getting in touch and co collaborating on this more or just talking about it, uh, let me know. And this is what the AI Trust label looks like. So here on the right side, we can see that we have included five central values in the AI Trust label. These values are transparency, accountability, privacy, fairness, and reliability of systems. And in order to operationalize it, we have a standardized questionnaire for each of these values that is built up in a th four step process. Uh, and I will show you in a minute what, what exactly that looks like. And as you see, for each of those five values, you can then have a rating between A and G, right? So the standard doesn't say that you need to follow these, um, these requirements and then you follow the standard or you don't follow the standard, but rather it gives you a wide variety of different implementation possibilities that then correspond to a certain level of AI trustworthiness. So for example, for transparency level C, there are certain requirements. And for transparency level D, those requirements are lower. And for transparency level A, those requirements are the highest. I'll show you also soon what exactly this lo that looks like and how you can then use it. And if you look at the coloring and also the, uh, the steps that we have used from A to G, you can see that we have been inspired by other labels, specifically the energy efficiency or energy use label that you have on a lot of your electrical 
uh, works on your appliances, for example, in your kitchen or in your bathroom. So these are the five labels, uh, these are the five values that we have developed and that we have specified within the label. And I've said that there is a form of standardized questionnaire on how you need to implement something. And this is divided up into four steps. The highest step is the value itself, transparency. And for each value, we define a set of between three and five criteria that are central for the value. I will show you in a minute what this, uh, what an example looks like for the value of transparency. And for each criterion, we then have a set of two to maybe five, six indicators that again uh, show whether that need to be met for a certain criterion to be met. And then for each indicator, we have a group of observables and these observables are then ranked from A to G. So this is the level uh, of where it says specifically, on the observables level, where it says specifically what you need to do to um, gain a certain level of transparency um, and where you can find a specific guidelines for implementation in practice, for operationalization of the value of transparency, right? So we have a several a step, a several step process. It is built a bit like a tree or like a pyramid. Um, and this is necessary in order to be as detailed as we can or as is necessary for implementing those values in practice. But in order to still keep a form of overview and of, uh, a way for anyone who uses the label or wants to understand it to be able to understand it, um, and for you not to lose uh, orientation within it. So let's look at the value of transparency to be a little bit more specific. What are we even talking about? What do values, indicators, criteria, and observables look like? So for transparency, we have defined four criteria. That would be that for uh, an AI system to be considered transparent, there are four different areas where you need to work on your transparency. Number one would be the documentation of data sets. So what data are you using? Uh, where is it coming from? You need to document that and public it, publicize it. Secondly, you need to be transparent about the AI system's operation. How is it being used? Where is it being used? Where is it supposed to be used? Third, you need intelligibility. So for each of the system outputs, you need to be able to understand where these outputs come from, right? This all falls under uh, the headline of explainable AI. So uh, processes that you have to be able to understand why did this job filter filter out the uh, application A, but not filter out application B, or why was I, in France, not admitted to a certain university, but admitted to a different university. Intelligibility of how the system works in general, but also how individual outputs of the system came about. And number four is accessibility, right? So we have a lot of information, a lot of documentation in the first three criteria, but all of these information need to be accessible. You need to be able to find it somewhere. You need to be able to understand it. And this is the second step. First step, transparency, the value. Second step are these four criteria. And then underneath these criteria, we have indicators and under each indicator, the set of observables. So we look now at the example of the first criteria, documentation of data sets. And under that, we have two indicators. And the first indicator is and the indicators are always formed as a question. So the first indicator is, is the data's origin documented? And then you can look at the observables to understand what level are you following? What level has your system reached? So if you have a structured data sheet that includes detailed information of on data handling, on the data collector, and on the data collection method, then you can... Um, tick a little box and you can say, yes, okay, here within this indicator, I have reached level A. 
But if it does not contain all of this information, um, or only very few, yeah, then you would only reach level B. Now, if you have that information, but it is not structured in a data sheet, it might be loose in some kind of PDF document or somewhere on the website, it's not within a unified data sheet, then you reach level C and so on and so forth, right? So these are only the first three levels that I've shown here. And so on, we define what up until level G, what, uh, yeah, what kind of data origin documentation exists that then allows you to understand what level do you have in your system. And a second kind of indicator uh, would be, are the characteristics of data sets analyzed and documented? So is there structured information about the characteristics of data sets, including all mentioned characteristics? There, we have a short list within our standard that defines what kind of characteristics we need. And then you get an A. And then if you look lower at the level C, if you have structured information, but it doesn't mention uh, or it doesn't cover all of these characteristics, then you only reach level C and so on and so forth. And that's what we would have defined for each of the uh, criteria for transparency. And the same thing goes for all the other four values. How can we now use this in practice? How could you use this in practice? Well, there are uh, three different ways that you can use it. So number one would be that you can communicate to consumers how your product was developed, how your product is designed, and what kind of standard you're following. You can easily say, we, our system, right, our um, storage optimization system, logistical optimization system for hospitals, it follows transparency level B. And that's pretty good, right? That's the second highest level. So consumers can then trust in your, uh, in your product more easily. That would be the first way that you can use uh, the system, right? So for communication outside of your company or outside of your team. You can also tell your team or suppliers how you want a certain system developed. So if you have a supplier that provides, for example, certain data sets for your work, you can look into our standard. And if you say, okay, I ultimately want transparency level A, you can send the standard to the supplier, and then they will understand what kind of descriptions, what kind of data sheets, um, or what kind of other documentation they need to provide additionally to the data itself. Or of course, you can tell your team that you're working on, working with on, uh, on a certain system, on an application filter, for example, that you want to reach a certain level of transparency, and then people understand what they need to do to reach that level. And thirdly, you can, when you have already developed a system that is being, being in use or that is about to come into use and that is about to be launched, then you can understand what a certain level me means and what you need to do to reach a certain level. So you could look at your system. You could look at what you have achieved, right? What on the observables level is actually present in your system and then give yourself a label. And if you want to reach a certain higher level, then you know exactly what you need to do to reach a higher level. Two more things about how the system is used. So we've talked about the observables and we've talked about how these specify and give you specific guidance on what you need to do to reach a certain level. But how do you calculate your ultimate level, right? If you have all of your observables figured out, if you know exactly how your system was developed and how it was designed, how do you then calculate what transparency level you have? Well, within the standard, we have a, or we've developed a small tool that helps us to calculate this. But in general, there are three different types of indicators um, that we have, right? So not each indicator ha is, has the same importance or the same meaning. Some indicators might be extremely important. They might be necessary for other indicators to even make sense. So if I have one indicator about a certain documentation being published 
and another indicator about the documentation cons uh, having all of the necessary information in it, then of course, having the information is more important or a prerequisite for uh, docu documentation to be published. So if you publish the documentation, but it doesn't have anything in it, any substance, then you can't get an A uh, on publishing it and a G on substance, and then it averages out, right? That doesn't make sense. So that's why we have negative indicators. Those indicators need to reach a certain level, and that is, in a way, then the maximum that you can reach. So if your documentation is completely void of content, then you get a G, no matter what the other indicators say with regard to this specific criterion. So here in this example, one, criteria, one indicator says A, one indicator says C. C is the negative anchor, um, so you get a C overall. You can also have positive indicators, positive anchors. Uh, and these might be indicators where you have different ways to achieve something. So there's maybe one way to publish a documentation, but there are also other ways to publish a documentation. If there's many different ways how to publish it, then all of these are positive indicators. You only need to have A in one of them uh, in order to have an A overall. But most of the indicators are actually score indicators. So where we uh, believe that the importance that all the indicators are similarly important um, and they have no pre, they don't have a special relationship to one another. They're not prerequisites to one another. So then we just score them and average them out. That's how you would calculate it. Now let's look at the ecosystem of regulation. So I've talked about the standard and you probably, if you've read a bit about AI ethics or AI regulation, then you know that a lot of stuff is happening in that area. There's a lot of talk about different regulations. So why do we even need this standard? Um, well, we've considered all of the regulation that's currently being developed, uh, namely and mainly the EU AI regulation. So the AI Act that the European Commission is currently working on. It's not public yet. It's not in force yet. So technically, there is no regulation yet. Um, but we know already what roughly is going to be in that regulation. There have been drafts published and um, we're currently in a phase where there's a lot of comments and amendments uh, going to happen. Um, so we have developed the label to be complementary to the EU regulation because the EU regulation will likely have specific regulation only for high-risk areas. Uh, but our label can be used for all kinds of systems, independent of whether it is super high risk or not. Um, uh, and it therefore fits, uh, is complementary to the proposed EU AI Act. And the EU AI Act even mentions codes of conduct as a way to implement the regulation, excuse me, the regulation from the European Union. And that's exactly what, um, what our uh, proposal also is. And we have also looked at the, all the other standards that are out there from ISO, from IEC in different areas. And we have tried to ensure compatibility with them. So if there's something already defined in a different standard, we don't need to just copy it in our standard. We can simply include it. As you see here with the value reliability under the criterion resilience, we have included an IEC standard and there are other standards that we have included in other, under other values or other, under, under other criteria as well. So the label, uh, number one, is not something that goes on top, but it is compl complementary to uh, regulation from the European Union or also um, other national regulations that we've looked at. It is compatible to existing uh, industrial standards. But it is also already in force, right? Our label is published. Our standard is published. So you can start using it right away. While the EU AI regulation might still need a little bit until it is being implemented. Let's go into the conclusion. Um, so we have seen, or I've tried to present to you what the 
label is, what our VDE spec is, how it works, how it can help you as a technologist, as a software developer, as a data scientist. And we have looked at how it interacts with different other kinds of regulation. But now what are the limits uh, of this um, proposed regulation? What is the, What are the limits of our standard and of our um, approach? And one, one thing that we've definitely discussed about a lot, especially when we talked with the uh, professionals from the industry, from the companies that were part of our consortium, is how much detail is actually enough and how much detail is too much. Right? We need to try to find a balance between having something that's easily understandable, that you can communicate easily to consumers, that consumers can easily understand. Right, Consumers need to understand what transparency level A means, what transparency level E means. But on the other hand, it also needs to be detailed enough for those people who are actually building the system, who are designing them, to understand what they need to do and what kind of guidelines they need to follow to reach a certain level of transparency. And this has been a balance that we've worked on um, and that we've tried to achieve with our proposal. A second challenge that we had is that even ethical values are not completely measurable. Not everything in ethics can be operationalized in a label. So if we look at fairness, the value of fairness, and if we go back to the example that I've used initially of the job application filter, then there are certain things that we can measure about it. But one question would remain, and that would be what would a fair application filter look like. So you could, for example, say, if we take the example of a software company and to the software company, mostly men apply. Uh, let's say 80% of the applications that come in are from men. And in the past, this was even higher. 90% or 95% of the applications were for men. Right? Just a hypo hypothetical example. Um, and if you now use a machine learning system, it might transmit that bias, right? And then also filter out and only present or mainly present men uh, or applications by men uh, to the human resources department. If you say, well, this is not fair um, because now we have 20% female applicants, um, we need more of them also present in the top uh, top 10. Um, then you need to define fairness in this specific context. What would fairness be? Is fairness that you have the same amount of applications filtered out as came in, um, or the same um, relation of applications, right? So if you have 80-20 coming in, you want 80-20 coming out. Or do you want it to be fair in relation to the representation in the general population? You want maybe to have a more diverse workforce. You know that there are advantages to it. So in the general population, it's roughly 50-50. So I also want in my top 10 applications that are filtered out for it to be 50-50. Or maybe you even want a different kind of uh, relation between um, applicants by males and uh, applicants by females. But all of, all of this cannot be defined in a standard because it's very context-specific and up to also debate. You need to talk about it and reflect on what fairness means in a specific area. So we can't define everything in the label, right? We can't put in, it needs to be, fair is only what is representative of the general population. But what we can do is that we focus on indicators for processes instead of products. So with regard to fairness, and this specific question, we do have three indicators in our um, standard that are relevant. One of them would be, are all entities impacted and or influenced by the system considered? Have you considered that you might be discriminating against someone? Have you considered maybe including representatives from certain groups in your, um, in your development team, in your process, in order to avoid an unconscious bias in this area or an unwanted bias? Then... Is there a commitment to a fairness definition? And has that fairness definition been published? Right? So we're not saying the fairness definition needs to be this and or that, but we're saying there needs to be a fairness definition. You need to have thought about it and it needs to be public. So then 
it comes, it is up to public scrutiny, it is pub, up to um, the general public, um, or for example, NGOs or other kinds of watchdogs to decide and to debate what is fair or if this specific system, um, if the fairness definition used in this specific system is all right. And uh, thirdly, we have also one indicator that relates to metrics to track and evaluate fairness, whether they are in place and whether they are public. Right. So we can define very more specifically on what a process needs to look like. And then we need to have checks and balances, testing, monitoring in place. And that we can also define. But we can't define beforehand what specifically the pro product needs to look like because that is very, um, very context specific. At least that's the solution <laughs> we came up with by avoiding this area a bit and focusing on processes. And the third challenge that we faced in our uh, general work was, especially when talking to uh, people from the industry, well, how do we relate this new standard to the status quo? Right? If there's no regulation, you're always fighting an uphill battle, trying to include, trying to improve transparency of systems, trying to improve accountability of the teams and the companies that are using those systems. And that includes costs, right? That uh, includes processes you have to set up, checks you have to set up, um, hours have to of work have to be put into this. Um, and we, of course, want to make it also attractive for companies to use the standard. So that has been a discussion, an ongoing discussion on um, how do we relate this quote-unquote new standard that is based, though, on existing uh, human rights, on existing ethical values with the status quo in the industry. And that's where also some of the questions come up uh, or came up that I wanted to pose to you um, that... I would be really interested to hear your take on, right? So how do you perceive the status quo in the industry and are ethical consideration, considerations implemented in your work today? And um, what would be challenges to implementing it, right? So what, if you think about you want to implement them in your team or in your company, what would challenges be? And if you want to overcome these challenges, what do you need? What do you need from us or what do you need from a standard or from an AI trust label for you to work? If you have any thoughts uh, on any of these points, uh, feel free to uh, ping me, to, um, uh, to write me. I would love to chat about it and to learn more about it. And if you're now interested in working a bit with this, and if you're interested in bringing AI ethics from principles to practice, then these are a few, um, a few points where you can maybe start. You can start discussing in your team how risky your the AI systems you're using um, or, or building, how risky they actually are, what your application contexts are, to figure out how much relevance does this have for you. You can then simply use the standard. You can maybe start with a part of it. You can say, okay, let's start just with transparency and take a look at our processes that we have currently in place um, and our practices that we have, and let's try to establish better practices. And then you can, of course, start communicating about your work, communicating that you think this is important, that it's important that your systems are transparent, that it's important that uh, your processes are accountable, and that this is the way you're doing this and ensuring this. And if you consider joining us, working with us on this, uh, feel free to get in touch because, as I've said, we're moving into an, uh, the next phase in the project where we will go into more specifically developing the AI ethics label. And it will stay a living document uh, where we are welcome input uh, from anyone. Yeah, so feel free to get in touch. You can download the standard with the short link that you can see here. And you can also download the old version that we had published about two years ago, about one pandemic ago. Um, were, which were laid the groundwork for the standard that was there today. And of course, you can find me on Twitter and online uh, or on LinkedIn and ResearchGate. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, feel free 
to ping me or write in the in the chat. And I hope you have a nice uh, day and rest of the conference here at Conferconf.